welcome everybody. Good afternoon here in, in Barcelona, Europe. Uh, good night uh, or morning, depending on the, if you're in Australia or in the States. Uh, welcome to this IATEL webinar. No, It's uh, part of the webinar series that we organize as uh, one of the initiatives of the European Association of Technology Enhanced Learning. We organize these webinars um, with different intentions. Uh, some of the webinars are meant to really disseminate basic baseline knowledge or transversal aspects that are of, are of uh, interest uh, to the community as a whole. Other initiatives uh, that we uh, include in this webinar series have to do with uh, really uh, communicating or disseminating top research, high level research that we do in our community. Yeah, so that the, we keep high standards. Uh, uh, in, in educational technology research. And of course, quite clear representative of high level research in, in technology enhanced learning, educational technologies is uh, represented by the uh, research that is presented in the European Conference on Technology Enhanced Learning, and particularly those research, uh, those pieces of research that is uh, has been awarded as based uh, papers uh, in, in, in our conferences. So this is uh, what we are doing now. This is a webinar focused on short presentations of the papers that were awarded in ACTEL 2020. So now Mark uh, introduce the papers. Thank you very much, Davinian. Thank you everyone for coming, for being here and for being available for presenting your work. Today we are going to see three different papers. The first one is going to be presented by Camille. I don't know how to pronounce this. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> That's fine. Aksenolo, but Camille is totally fine. Camille? Yeah. <laughs> um, and he's going to present Exploring Learner Controlled Peer Group Selection in a Technology Enhanced Learning Environment. Then uh, I will give you some minutes now, Camille, but I'm going to present the rest. Then we are going to have Ali Darbiski and Hassan Koshravi presenting employee peer review to evaluate the quality of student generated content at scale. And then we are going to have our last paper, which is designing conversational agents for collaborative tasks, implications for design and practitioners, which is Constantinos Mikos. So, as you know, all uh, we have been working on a small presentations in order to have more time for discussion. Uh, the presentations will be 10 minutes and then we will leave some time for questions. So hello everyone, uh, thanks for joining today. My name is Camille, I'm a PhD student at the University of Pittsburgh and I'm going to present our work on student controlled social comparison, which is a collaboration between our lab, Utrecht University and Southern University of Chile. So. First of all, based on social comparison theory, uh, actually uh, people evaluate their own attitudes, abilities uh, by comparing with others, which leads to self-evaluation and actually this influence their behaviors. And in education, uh, given the reverse system, uh, this leads to social comparison among the learners and many researchers uh, explore social comparison in many different educational settings. The researchers that concentrated on open social learner models find out that social features help students to navigate better and also increase their engagement with the learning uh, environment. And also in another, in another study, researchers find out that actually social comparison features accounted for high completion rates. However, uh, this is not always the case. In another study also concentrated on MOOCs, uh, uh, researchers find out that peer excellence uh, actually leads to increased drop rate. And they explained this as the negative outcome of the social comparison due to feeling of failure or threats to self-integrity. So uh, these findings shows us the importance of peer selection in social comparison. Uh, and for example, uh, concentrated on the direction of the comparison, upward social comparison, which is the case where you compare yourself with the peers that are better than you. Uh, it is better to keep this gap between you and the, uh, your peers at a reachable limit uh, to keep your motivation high or also decrease any possible negative feelings like feeling of failure. So 
Uh, following these suggestions and findings in the literature, we design an online learning environment using open social learning model features, and we extend it by providing learner controlled peer group selection. Uh, we hypothesize that this will keep positive impact of social comparison and will decrease negative effects through learner control. So we introduced these new features on a system which is called Python Grids, which is an online practice system, which firstly introduced in ECTL 2014, where the contents were organized under a set of topics. If a student click on a topic, they can access various learning content and they can practice with each uh, content interactively. Uh, based on their interaction, the uh, in-system progress increased and it is reflected in their open learner models as shown here. So higher green color uh, means that more progress and also the system accumulates the average uh, uh, class uh, progress average in the third row and it helps students to compare their progress to the class average uh, by using the middle row where green color topics means that students are ahead of the class average whereas the topics with blue colored uh, means that uh, students need to catch the class average also they can see an anonymized ranked list if they click on this button whenever they want so on top of these open social learner model features we added uh, new control features that uh, students can select from three different options to compare their progress to. So every student start with default by comparing to the class average and they could uh, switch to lower progress or higher progress uh, depending on uh, what they would like to compare their progress to. And based on this selection, uh, the visualization changed significantly as you will notice right now. For example, let's, uh, for example, click on the lower progress and my uh, uh, comparison changed very uh, dramatically where I see that in all topics, I'm ahead of the lower half of the class. But if I compare my progress to the higher half of the class, I see that I need to work in most of the topics to catch the uh, higher half of the class, which we believe that might affect the student behavior within the system. To explore these uh, ideas, we ran a, uh, a semester long cl classroom study at Utrecht University. We use Python grids uh, as the optional practice and all students use uh, the system with the control features. In this paper, we analyzed uh, the logs of 44 students. So. The first thing that we check if the students actually use these features or not, and we see that they extensively use this feature. For example, on average, they uh, changed their group more than 17 times and they were accessing the ranked list more than three times throughout the semester, which shows that actually they kind of would like to at least explore their uh, ranking or progress among the peers. Then we would like to see the preferences and stability of these selections because uh, the more the students stick to a comparison group selection, we believe that uh, the behavior might be affected by the selection. What we see that most of the time students were practicing uh, with the system while the class average was selected as their uh, comparison group. But we also see that there's a tendency that these group of students actually uh, prefer to compare themselves more to the higher half of the class, uh, which we think that this is the kind of the tendency towards upward social comparison. And we also see that students were performing many exploratory group changes, which means that actually one group change is followed by another group change without performing any learning activity. So we think that students would like to explore their progress state within peers and stick mostly to class average or high progress uh, group to keep practicing within the system. Uh, we also checked that uh, these preferences were kind of stable throughout the semester. And each week we see that at least half of the active students uh, changing their uh, comparison group. Uh, this connects us to the more deeper analysis that we conducted, which were more session based, where we tried to associate the uh, social comparison actions with the learning actions that performed within each session. So first thing that we checked is uh, the comparing the sessions where students uh, perform the comparison event versus the sessions that 
students did not perform any comparison event. Based on our prior findings in the field, we hypothesized that if students perform the social comparison event, they could be engaged more with the learning activities. Uh, we find the similar uh, uh, results in this study, where if students uh, perform a change within a session, they uh, actually engage with the uh, system more and they were accessing more learning content, where compared to the sessions where they did not uh, make any comparison change. And we also find out that actually students were working similarly in their early and later sessions, uh, according to the number of uh, content that they have access. Uh, next, we would like to see if social comparison uh, leads students to work with more easier content or not, because uh, students can increase their progress within the system by just clicking on animations or viewing examples instead of uh, problem solving activities, which could be a negative effect of social comparison in these settings. But we did not find significant effect of social comparison events on such uh, uh, selection of content. Uh, where we concluded that students actually do more work within a session, regardless of the activity type. But what we see is that uh, in earlier sessions, students kind of concentrate more on examples, and then later they switch to problem solving activities, which kind of already uh, uh, what we find in our in in other studies that we were conducting related to worked out examples. And this connects to another uh, deeper check that uh, after we think there is a correlation between the usage and the social comparison events, we would like to see what happens if uh, what is uh, the effect of direction of the social comparison. So, for example, what happens if I compare myself uh, to the uh, higher half of the group class or lower half of the class, depending on my progress state? So, what we find out is that if a student start uh, in the higher half of the class, which means that on the left hand side, this part, and if they compare themselves to the higher half of the class, they engage more with the le uh, learning system, as you can see here, this uh, change. However, this same effect does not hold uh, for the students who start in the lower half of the class. If they compare themselves to the lower half when they start the session, actually it affects them negatively and they engage less with the learning activities. So we con concluded this finding as that this is one of the uh, positive outcome of uh, upward social comparison that we find within this study. And finally, we would uh, like to check if these new features added to open social learner modeling have any navigation support or increase navigation support within the system. And we see that if students kind of perform the mesh comparison, meaning that they find their uh, uh, comparison group within the session, they kind of find right topics, where, uh, the topics that they need to catch the group uh, significantly more compared to the other sessions. So uh, to summarize, what we find in the study is that uh, these control features uh, used very uh, considerably throughout the semester and students kind of uh, perform more practice regardless of the activity types if they performed also a social comparison event. We see uh, that uh, there's a positive uh, effect of up for social comparison on engagement. And we also see that these new control features have students to find the better topics to practice. Uh, in our future work, which is kind of our current ongoing studies, uh, we are conducting new, new classroom studies with and without these control features. And we are uh, conducting these studies in multiple countries. And we are trying to explore the effect of individual differences and prior knowledge on social comparison uh, preferences and also the system usage. So thanks for listening. and. Uh, if you have any questions, I can answer. Thank you very much, Camille. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. That were uh, 12 minutes, but you, you did very well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know if you have any, any questions from the attendants. The mic is open. Anyone that wants to ask? I would like to ask something. 
I don't know who talked. <laughs> Costas. Ah, Costas. Yes. Go ahead. Please. Yeah. Well, while you were explaining the, um, uh, that they tend to uh, compare themselves with a higher group, yeah, how yeah. did you interpret this uh, behavior? I didn't uh, understand it this very well. Ah, okay. Yeah. So I mean. I think I kind of rush a little bit uh, <laughs> to keep the pace. So, okay. Uh, so what what I mean by like comparing to higher half is maybe I can explain here. So by default, every student start with this view. I mean, there was no green or blue at the start, but uh, throughout the semester students in the class do some work and use do some work and this grid starts to uh, fill with the colors. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, if you don't change, you always see the class average. So every student uh, aggregated together to reflect the average on the third row. But if you click to the, for example, lower progress, which means that you are comparing yourself to the lower half. So what we do here is that we just take the students who like by the median of the progress and just uh, aggregate their progress here. And if you compare yourself to the higher half, which means that you click here and then now we are comparing your progress with the students who are actually uh, working uh, more within the system. Uh, this is what I meant by uh, like comparing yourself to the higher or comparing to yourself to the lower half of the class. And based on your, uh, depending on uh, your current situation, we did some analysis. Like if I'm in the higher half of the class and I am comparing myself to the higher half or I'm in the lower half and I'm comparing myself to the lower half. Uh, so yeah, that was the analysis that we performed there, which we see this uh, different you. effect. Avinia has a question also. Yeah, um, highly interesting research. Um, um, I wanted to ask if you have uh, considered um, the um, effects um, this may have in, in the well-being of the students. So, uh, for example, in the stress or the frustration they may experience when comparing themselves with the, with the others uh, in social comparison. Uh, mm. uh, yeah. yeah, actually, I always feel that uh, there are some students they don't like comparing or they don't feel good about this comparison. So first of all, uh, what we think that the system is an optional system. Uh, we just give them two person credit just uh, for their assignment submission. It's not even a grade that they get out of the system. And these are not their grades that directly reflect their performance or I don't know, the success in the class. This is just their time uh, uh, in the system, which they they just compare their progress within the system and we believe their students know, already know that if they don't work in the system there, they could be in the lower half of the class. So this just may be a little bit decreasing the effect of these negative feelings, but we are trying to uh, collect some uh, throughout the questionnaires that if they uh, feel bad or good. I mean, for this study, we have limited uh, uh, ability to collect more data, but we are trying to collect more information, how they feel, or if they still interested, feel motivated for programming, those kinds of questionnaires that we are trying to collect. But yeah, I, or, I'm trying to kind of uh, think about those negative feelings and try to reduce them. Uh, but thanks for question, uh, for the question. Thank you very much. We have one more minute for questions. If you don't have any questions, I have a question. <laughs> also, <laughs> ah, ah, Hassan, Hassan has a question, right? Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for the for the talk. Um, two two quick ones for me. Um, yeah. Would it also make sense to have an option that is no comparison at all? I just see my what I'm doing without any comparison, and kind of see whether that is preferred as the option yeah. that they. Um, and secondly, uh, and I know there's ethical issues and applications, but I wonder if, and you might've mentioned that in your future work, um, that running this as a controlled experiment that they can actually choose between them, but you put them into groups of no comparison, higher or lower, um, might, might give you more in terms of the aggregate results or whether there was more motivation or more engagement or not. Um, theoretically, it makes most sense to me that you put them into the group that they are. So if I'm in the lower, part of the uh -huh. class 
compared with the lower part. If I'm in the high, higher part, I'm compared with that. But great work and thank you for sharing. Uh, thank you very much. So I, I will start from the second one. So yes, uh, I agree with you. Uh, so currently, as you can see here, we ha have just two options to select this kind of very static or I mean, uh, very similar options. I'm trying to come up with new ideas where students actually uh, select their peers on a continuum scale without having these uh, options. And also we are trying to move towards more adaptive adaptation in this social comparison, which the system actually decides which peers to select for the uh, students. So actually I'm trying to understand how students change their comparison within this uh, uh, system usage and trying to come up with some uh, these uh, automatic ideas that we can just maybe propose students, okay, you need to compare with these peers. And may you quickly repeat your first question? I'm sorry, I forget oh, no, that one. No one at all. So there's an option that you don't compare them with anyone. Ah, okay, so, well, we have a, a history of uh, uh, using the social comparison in uh, this open learner models. We had an option, uh, we actually explored this idea before, but in another culture, not in Netherlands, we explored it in Finland. We see that very few students actually turn off or turn on their comparison feature, uh, like maybe 5% of them. But this could be the, because of the design of the system which was not uh, that apparent like this one, which is just on top of the open learner model. So I'm also planning to explore that option again, but uh, following that our prior findings, we just uh, move with this design actually in this study. Yeah, uh, thanks for asking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camille. We have yeah. to continue with the next presentation. Yeah. Uh, if you have any other question, I think they can contact you, right? Yes, of course, always. <laughs> Just search my name and my university, I think you will find me. Very well. Davinia <laughs> is going to introduce the next presenter. Yes, ah, so uh, next presentation uh, will be by Ali Darvishi, Hassan Korazvi coming both from the University of Queensland and the title of the presentation and the paper that was uh, awarded at the ECT in 2020 was Employing Peer Review to Evaluate the Quality of Student-Generated Content at, at a Scale. Now the word is for you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hassan, as mentioned, from the University of Queensland, and I'll be co-presenting with Ali. Ali, you want to say a quick hello? Hi everyone, I'm Ali, a PhD student under the supervision of Hassan Khosravi in the University of Queensland. Thank you for your invitation. So I'm going to quickly talk about introduction and motivation of what we're doing, then I'm going to uh, present the Ripple platform that we've been working on, then I'm going to pass it on over to Ali to talk about the different inference models that we've got, then we'll talk about evaluation and some future work. Learn sourcing is a new word, but an old concept, refers to pedagogically supported forms of crowdsourcing to mobilize the learner community as experts in training to contribute to teaching and learning. Um, it has been used quite extensively in the literature before to get students to create content or in peer evaluation and peer review. Um, the word learner sourcing came from Kid, um, Jua Kim from his dissertation work from MIT a few years ago. And recently we've been working on charting the design and analytics of it in learning sourcing systems. The many benefits, students um, get engaged in higher order learning, recognize them as partners, help them develop evaluative judgment, and you kind of lead the development of these large repositories of study material via crowdsourcing. Um, for that to, to nature, the, the first question is, can students really create high quality resources? And past um, research does suggest that yes, most of the time they can, um, create high quality learning resources that meet rigorous judgment and statistical criteria. But however, there's some of the resources that students create are low quality, ineffective, inappropriate, or even incorrect. So our aim is really thinking about assuming that we have this large repository of learner source resources. Can we partner with the students themselves to evaluate the quality of these resources? And what sort of methods can we use in order to do that? Um, for that, I'm going to talk about a platform that we've been developing. It's called Ripple. It's been developed at the University of Queensland for the past two years now. 
um, Ali is going to put a quick chat um, text um, there with, with a link to the website and information about Ripple. It's free and open access. So if you're interested in using it, please do reach out to us. Um, but it has four main features, learner sourcing, getting students to create and evaluate. Then that the repository of resources are used within an adaptive learning system that um, recommends resources to students. We're also very much uh, involved with open learner models as well. So it was great to see that in the previous talk. Um, it also has live formative quizzes and peer learning that students can use as well. In terms of the system, so student creation, there is a variety of different learning resources that students can create multiple choice questions, answered work examples. This is an example of what a multiple answer question would look like. Um, once a resource is created, it is going to go through a moderation process where uh, multiple students are asked to use a rubric similar to this with some criteria to determine the quality of the resource. Finally, they put a decision, their confidence in their assessment, and they justify their decision and provide feedback. What we do is then, given uh, very much like academic journals, you've got uh, multiple reviews coming in on one question. The difference is we automatically want to make a decision about what the final quality needs to be and whether it's going to reject it, whether it's going to be rejected or approved. Uh, a quick data reflection from the data we've captured from the platform. This is looking at 65,000 moderations from uh, 2,500 learners and 28 instructors based on 14,000 resources. And what we see is when experts give a high rating, um, you also get a high rating from students. So that's not a problem. Um, the problem arises when experts give a low rating, the, the students are still by and large giving a high rating. So when instructors reject a resource, giving it a one or a two, the chance of students also rejecting is only 16%, while the majority of them are still identifying it as high quality. So identifying low quality resources based on peer review is a challenge that we're facing in the platform and in the literature that also come up. Um, and also, there's a trade-off between accuracy and interpretability in any machine learning algorithm you use. There's many machine learning-based algorithms that you consensus based on the values that you've got. However, as you use fancier uh, machine learning algorithms, the accuracy will go up, but the interpretability or the explainability of result will come down. There is a lot of benefits in having um, systems that are explainable because it allows students to act on feedback, regulate their learning, and it has many benefits, similar to open learner models as well. So really, we're looking at how we can evaluate student-generated content accurately, transparently, and fairly at the same time. Um, Ali, over to you. Thanks, Hassan. Here is the definition of our problem. How can we use the subjective ratings of a student on a resource to infer its true quality? Our aim is to identify reliability for each user as their decision weight, such that the quality can be inferred using a weighted average method. We will present and compare different models using various features. First, we take a set of well-known aggregation approach, such as baseline, majority vote, as our baseline, such as majority vote, mean, and median. These approaches only use the student provided numerical rating and assume an equal weight for all moderators. So the results are in favor of the majority in these models. And assuming that the rating above three would pass the moderation, all of this model would approve this resource. However, a number of resources, including this one, have been inspected by Inspirac in instructors and as we can see this example is rejected by the instructor which shows the failure of this baseline. Current model implemented in Ripple is a weighted aggregation approach based on the well adopted expectation maximization technique using the following steps. First, the scores of all students set to an initial value. Next, in the expectation step, the quality of a resource is inferred based on the current value of a student reliability. Then in the maximization step, the user's reliability are updated based on the goodness of their rating compared to the inferred quality of that resource. 
As we can see, the result is still biased toward the majority who overrate. Here, we formulated the problem in the form of a moderation graph, which consists of four kinds of uh, nodes, students, decision rating, resources, and instructors. This algorithm extends the EM model. The first two steps are very similar to the previous one. However, there is a third step that the moderator's reliability would propagate, would propagate in a network of uh, their peers. In this scenario, user scores would be changed based on the quality of their own decision and also their peers who are directly connected to them as a result of their collaboration in the previous moderation and evaluation. As we can see, this model works well by identifying the trustworthy student moderator with an optimal use of instructor's intervention to propagate the trust between users. Finally, this set of models consider features from the provided comments, including the alignment with the given rating, relatedness of comments to the resource and their length. In many cases, a student provide a positive, unhelpful comment like very good or great, but offer a low rating, which shows a misalignment between their comments and their provided rating. The function FSC using an advanced NLP tool rewards a student that have provided a longer related explanation and punish those who have provided a shorter unhelpful comments such as very good. As we can see in this example, the comment based model and the graph model have correctly identified the resource to be rejected while the current model has failed. Next, uh, we will discuss how this presented model were evaluated. The data set used in this study are obtained from piloting Ripple on two courses during a semester at the University of Queensland. More than 900 students have submitted near uh, 36,000 moderation on about uh, 7,000 learning resources. This plot also shows that students have quite diverse behavior in terms of their moderation numbers and comments length. However, the majority have provided an average rating with a mean above four, which shows that students are most likely to provide a high rating. Over to you, Hassan, for the result and concluding remarks. All right, thank you, Ali. Um, so just looking at some information based on these models, um, I know that a true negative response is this TNR, is essentially where we discuss there is, it's, it's hard to do. These are things that the instructor has rejected and we're looking to see how we can identify using a method to also reject those resources, which will also be reflected in the AUCs of the results. The TPR, the true positives in all of the models is pretty easy to identify. Um, so looking at baselines, the baselines are um, quite explainable because you know the students will understand them pretty well. But as we can see, they will fail with um, TNRs. They do well in TPRs, but it's not possible to use the majority in order to get um, correct answers in the TNRs. With the current model that we had, it's still quite explainable the way we've defined it. It does a little better in terms of AUC, but still not much better than before. The graph model that we had with trust propagation, it's, it's taking away from some of the explainability by giving a higher um, AUC to the models that we've got. The comment-based models, um, again, they do better, but at the cost of taking away from explainability, it, in particular relatedness or length times relatedness, um, those are using fancy NLP models which are not explainable to the students. Um, there's also a worry or a concern that if students know, for example, that you're using length as part of, um, as part of the way that you are, um, you are evaluating it, they might just write long, unrelated comments there. 
Um, finally, ensemble models that takes a combination of these as features and puts them together um, with the um, with with recent sort of ensemble models. Um, they do really, really well, uh, but the explainability really comes down. And I might just um, stop here because this one would be a good one to, to end on. Uh, not much after that, but really the problem that we've got is how do you come up with these models that are both explainable without sacrificing accuracy? And that remains to be in terms of the, the active research that we're doing in the platform to see how we can achieve that. Um, thank you. We open it up for questions, thoughts, and comments. Yeah, thank you for, for your presentation. Um, now, um, is it time for questions or comments? Who would like to start? I, I can start if no one willing Please. to ask. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, really, really nice work. I just uh, want to ask, like, since uh, I know some other related work where researchers try to find, for example, um, the quality of the work is kind of maybe uh, looking at the success of the students throughout the, maybe the selection of these uh, content along the way. For example, let's imagine that students accessing this content over an open learning model, they have the a chance to select which content to work and we combine this learner generated content together in the system and maybe i mean not just maybe evaluating the quality of the content but i just wonder if you already consider the the path of the learners that uh maybe lead to success or failure if they follow this such content along the way maybe like inter incorporating those results into your analysis i just want to ask if you yeah, to do or already did it. Uh, I appreciate the question. If I'm if I'm picking this up right, um, one alternative way of determining the quality is looking at future um, interactions of the students with the with the questions to see perhaps which questions would lead to higher learning gains if students. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. Something. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so there's two concerns with that. One of the concerns from instructors is that they don't want bad quality to be ever added to the repository because it might influence incorrect learning from students. So this step that we've got that it's going to evaluate it without seeing the engagement is kind of making a hard decision on is this going to go in or is it going to be taken out? Um, the other part is that there are really two, two main ways in education that, that is used as a gold standard for quality. One is going to instructors as your goal quality, which is what we've done here. The alternative is to look at learning gains, um, which is a little bit more challenging. We are working towards that, but we're not quite there yet. Thank you. Great question. Do you have more questions or comments? I have one question. Please go ahead, Mark. Um, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I would like to ask regarding the models, when you were showing the comparison between the models, you were talking about explainability, right? As some yeah. of them are more explainable than others. Are you selecting them because some of them are more explainable? And why do you select them? If they are more explainable, is it is it in terms of um, of computer science perspective, or is it in terms of how would you explain that to the teachers in the future, or or, or even the student? So, or for example, um, if 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 using peer review to grade someone, and the student sees that you know two people give me five and one person gave me one, why did I end up getting a low result? The majority was giving me a five. So that explainability in terms of also being able to demonstrate how a final decision is made so that students think it's fair um, in, in the context of education becomes an important part of it. And also for the instructor to understand it so that they can provide oversight in a meaningful way. And are you testing them with the, with the students so to see if they really understand this better or not? Um, yes, yeah, so what we're doing currently is um, so the platform, the way it works is it shows them the weight. Um, so they see the decision and they see the weight and they can determine that it's the average weight of that. 
but we're currently hiding away from them how that weight is defined or how, where we're getting that weight from. Um, and we're trying to make that all, also kind of more explainable as well, but that's, um, that's the challenge. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. I want to know more about the use case. So this is, and uh, the ultimate aim is to see if whether it is possible to have a good peer review system that evaluate the quality of this uh, content. However, I understand that the motivation of the learners to actually do this peer review is because the process is providing them some um, learning gains, a good learning experience, no, in a way. So I want to know more about that, whether the, the uh, use case or the, 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 the motivation or the objectives are, are in diff at different levels. Um, and also this, uh, this context, what is leading uh, the actual uh, peer reviewers to actually complete this task? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So um, within the work around crowdsourcing, incentives are an important part of any crowdsourcing system. Now, in outside of education, um, sometimes it's monetized that you get paid for crowdsourcing work. Um, within the platform, we, we've defined and we've designed the system such that it integrates to tie the platform to assessment. So some of these courses are using it towards an assessment. For example, there are four rounds within a semester or 13 week semester where each round a student is expected to create one resource that passes moderation and provide five evaluations you know, and answer some questions. And then the system also provides some oversight for the instructors um, with spot checking algorithms that we give instructors to spot check things where we think there's a, a higher chance of the wrong decision being made. Um, so the incentive is that it's tied to assessment for many of them. Yeah, good. Yeah, so as I, I suspected, eh, also we know that uh, the, the, the task of having a, a learners to create their own materials or their, their own questions is, is very uh, productive no? in terms of learning. So also the, the, the content creation and of course the peer review. Nice. Um, more questions or comments? If not, we move to the last but not least eh? uh, presentation for today. Mary is introducing it. Thank you, Davinia. Well, the last but not least, as Davinia said, is the presentation by Mikos Konstantinos. Um, I think he's now a postdoctoral researcher in University of Zurich, if I'm not wrong. Yes, you. Very well. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you for this invitation. And thank you, everybody, for joining here. Yeah, I'm Kostas Michos, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Zurich currently. I will present your paper that is a work done at the University of Valladolid at the HSC Chemical Research Group. And uh, you can see all the co-authors of this paper. Uh, yeah, as the title says, we are focusing on conversational agents uh, in the collaborative settings. And in fact, we are exploring different uh, strategies employed by conversational agents and seek to derive some recommendations for design or even for practitioners like uh, teachers or, or instructional designers. And uh, this work is being supported by the European CODMOOC uh, project. I will give you like an overview of uh, conversational agents and research related to this topic. Uh, conversational agents or chatbots are currently used in many fields like healthcare, marketing, tourism, and enable uh, actually natural language interaction between humans and computers. So for example, a human can have a dialogue with an agent. And we see like a significant potential of this interaction paradigm in the technology enhanced learning uh, field. And the reason here is that uh, dialogue is a mediator of uh, active student learning. And we have seen conversational agents explored in this context under different terms like pedagogical agents, chatbots, etc. We focus more on the ones that are having a more like pedagogical behavior. behavior. So I will present you some research that uh, relates to one-to-one -one learning settings. So one student can interact with an agent. This has shown some benefits for students. 
but a relatively lower number of studies have been conducted in group uh, settings. For example, imagine multiple students discussing and an agent intervening during the discussion, or even multiple agents intervening in the discussion. So in the context of computer support collaborative learning, this has also some benefits such as productive student dialogue, for instance, by promoting explicit reasoning. However, we see some problems in this, uh, based on the literature in these collaborative settings that students might be frustrated with agent, might don't want to talk to the agent or for example, prefer to talk to the partner. So sometimes they give simplified responses to an agent or they pay limited attention. So we think that this create, uh, makes difficult the conditions for fruitful interactions for learning. And uh, this has been associated on the one hand with some technological design elements, but on the other hand, on pedagogical design elements. One challenge here is how to provide uh, like adaptive collaborative learning support that will take into account uh, the student dialogue and the educational context, for example, the context of the discussion. It is even, even more challenging to design tasks, or not tasks, but um, strategies that they have some pedagogical behavior in real time. So we focus on these pedagogical design elements and we think that they should be more investigation on how they relate with uh, student benefits like uh, collaborative interactions, learning. And we propose a design space that could be addressed by non-technical stakeholders, for example, by teachers or instruction designers in the process of designing or co-designing such tasks. And this is composed of uh, at the task design. Um, a teacher might also uh, configure a domain model that will put some important uh, domain elements and also the behavior actually of the agent, the agent intervention strategies. So I will present you a study that we have done on the agent intervention strategies. In particular, a teacher here might uh, configure interactions that will happen between students, but also between the agent and the students. And this has been explored in research in CSEL, such as prompts for argumentation or CSEL uh, microscripts. And the agent here might provide social support on the other hand, cognitive support, but also might guide students through the task, like to orchestrate uh, collaboration. And in order to design such agent intervention strategies, different teaching learning frameworks have been used. In our case, we use one that is widely cited in this context, the academically productive talk. Uh, students, when they came in this type of academically productive talk, they show accountability to the student group or the community, to some relevant knowledge or evidence of rigorous thinking. And based on that, some uh, agent interventions or have been formulated that have some social aspects, for example, if you want, to agree or disagree with your partner and some others that they have some knowledge based uh, functions. For instance, if you want to connect uh, do two domain concepts. And uh, we have seen research in, done with APT moves in collaborative learning, but there, are, there is limited uh, research on different dimensions of the APT moves, for example, the learning community or accurate knowledge, and also to evaluate these dimensions in the same collaborative task. In the previous uh, uh, research, we saw that they evaluate, for instance, uh, student dialogue or participation and student satisfaction, for example, with the agents. I give you an example of some agent uh, interventions that we have configured. For example, a knowledge support agent that prompted students to uh, actually connect two domains of concepts and the social support agent that prompted students to add to their partner's contributions. So yeah, based on the pedagogical design element that I explained you, we focused on the agent intervention strategies and we formulated the, the research question on what, to what extent the design of a collaborative task that includes on the one hand knowledge-based as compared to social-based uh, agent interventions will impact the effectiveness of the task enactment. And in order to do that, uh, we did uh, similar uh, analysis as in previous research, we analyzed student dialogue and uh, student participation and their satisfaction with the task. 
So now I will briefly explain you the field study that we have conducted. It was a study in a university course. Participants were pre-service teachers and they were engaged in a brainstorming task. They were put in uh, pairs and they had to discuss and agree on uh, the main benefits of and problems of collaborative learning. How we did that, we used uh, the tool developing the call MOOC project that is composed by a teacher editor and uh, a student environment with chat. In the teacher editor, uh, a teacher might uh, describe a task and also the domain model like keywords uh, or relationship between keywords and also the aiding behavior that at the end will be displayed in the chat environment with some messages on to the students. So in this study, we did a between subject research design where we randomly assigned students into groups, knowledge support agent and social support agent. And we actually used the, exactly the same collaborative task and we triggered the interactions with the same uh, domain words. We did that in collaboration with the course instructors of, of this course. And as I explained you, we evaluated the student participation in dialogue based on the chat logs and we used a pre-post questionnaire. So now I will briefly explain you the coding scheme that we used in the content analysis. So different behaviors were evaluated like team management, for example, to what extent students uh, coordinate themselves for the task, but also how they go about solving the task by providing their opinions, solutions, etc. So what we see from the results is that in the knowledge support agent condition, students spend more time in uh, this collaborative task and also they submitted more messages to their partners. But looking more to the content of the discussions, we see that um, in the knowledge support agent condition, they actually reflect more on the domain concepts by taking into account these categories, explicit argument or position. But on the other hand, they seem to write more messages for team management in this condition. For example, uh, shall we start with activity? I'm going to start reading, for example. And in the social support agent condition, we saw more messages related to off-task behavior. With respect to student satisfaction, we uh, found a highly uh, satisfied student with the task. But in the knowledge support agent condition, they were more satisfied with the discussions. For example, the agent helped them to construct their, their argument. And about their satisfaction with the agent itself, they seem to be more satisfied with the knowledge support agent, but there could be some problems on the agent identifying the context of the discussion. So they say the conversation agent should appear right on issues we are dealing with, for example. So what we take from this uh, analysis is that uh, we have proposed this uh, space for the pedagogical design elements of uh, collaborative tasks with conversation agents. And we focus here on agent intervention strategies. In this uh, study, we uh, evaluated uh, the knowledge support agent, agent and social support agent in a brainstorming task. And we found better indicators in the knowledge support agent condition with respect to student dialogue, participation, and satisfaction. But the students seem to need more time for team management in this uh, condition. And we connect this with researching collaborative cognitive load and that this should be taken into account when you design such um, interventions in collaborative learning. Student satisfaction seem to be higher in the knowledge support condition in this case, but there is further need to um, improve the context awareness of the agent. So one design recommendation uh, from this uh, field study is that we might uh, use a combination of pedagogical agent behaviors, for example, the knowledge support agent or social support agent, but they should be adapted to the nature of the task and the student behavior. And yeah, well, there are some limitations that uh, we really need to investigate social support agent in other tasks. Uh, the knowledge support agent might be perceived more intelligent or competent by students. And there is a restriction with the APT moves that they are strictly connected with the domain model. 
So we might look into uh, collaboration aspects, how to model collaboration with learning analytics techniques, for example. But we reflect on that we might enhance these agent powers, but on the other hand, uh, we need to take into account that this can create a design burden for teachers on how they will configure these behaviors in advance. So we look more into task types uh, based on collaborative problem solving tasks. And also it is interesting to see this type of activities in distance learning contexts, especially in massive open learning courses. Yeah, this is pretty much what we have done. And just to briefly explain to you that we have done like a second study that focused on the task designs. And in this case, instead of, uh, for example, in the first study, we used two different intervention strategies in the same task. In the second one, we used two different tasks but the same intervention strategies. So to see the influence of the task. And in order to do that, we use this framework by McGrath, where you can uh, formulate tasks based on these dimensions. For example, brainstorming could be a creativity task, whereas an intellective task requires like a unique solution to a problem. So my different behaviors will emerge from the students. And we are currently analyzing the results for in this second study. So this is from me. And last, if you want to check further uh, the Colmoc project, this is the website. And there is also a virtual community of practice for devoted to conversational agents for, for learning, if you want to, to join this community. So thank you. A lot thank you very much. To your questions. Thank you, Costas. Thank you very much for the presentation. For questions. Oh, okay, has start. Um, really interesting work uh, as well. Um, I, I was about to ask about the the future work, no? What happened after this mm -hmm. paper at the CITEL? So I was uh, really glad to see uh, that you included this uh, couple of slides talking about a second experimental design, um, and it was interesting to see also the model of type uh, of tasks, of, so task classification. So my question is, because there are a number of classifications for task types, why you selected that? Why this was especially uh, relevant or useful for the analysis you are doing, the studies you are doing? Great, thanks, Davina, for the question. Yeah, well, uh, we are working in this uh, small group learning setting, for example, with pairs. And it seems that this, uh, the same framework has been used in this small group learning setting. Also, we find that this uh, framework has been also used with uh, social agents, but in another context with robots, for example. And it could be relevant in the case of conversational agents, for example, with uh, chats. That is why uh, it will be interesting to explore it. Yeah. And a uh, second question is, yeah. mm, the effects that the the skills the previous skills of the of the students may have in their need for more uh, social scaffolding no whether this is something you're considering in your analysis uh, because of course educational level no the level of education may have an impact in the skills uh, learners may have when contributing no uh, in a in group discussion so this may also have an effect on the level of, um, of the, how they react with these uh, prompts that are coming from an agent at the social mm -hmm. uh, regulation level. Yeah, thanks also for this question. Yeah, actually we used like a pre-questionnaire where we ask students in the second study the level of knowledge, self-perceived knowledge on the domain concepts. So we might differentiate them based on this and we further analyze their behavior based on the prior perceived, let's say, knowledge. But it will be, yeah, interesting to, to explore further. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the answers. Mm -hmm. I just see it interested to me yeah. a lot. So Great. maybe more thank questions you. from the audience. I have one question. Maybe you already talked, but maybe I missed. Yeah, uh, sure. did, you check, uh, did you check if these two conditions affect the participation of the pairs in discussion? I mean, for example, maybe knowledge-based agent lead to push one student to talk more, but maybe social agent make them talk equally 
uh, in discussions. Do you have? Yeah, actually, in, the, inside... in this re result, sorry to go back uh, here in the participation, uh, we see that students take more time in the knowledge support teaching condition, but also they submit more messages to their partners in the knowledge support agent condition. Okay. So it seems to be like, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, I have you. one last question, if I may, if no one is going to ask. Yeah. I think no one has raised his hand, their hand. Okay. Um, regarding your, your future work, you are going to make some prompts, right? This is what I understood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Prompt, oh, like sending a so. message <laughs> and. and uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, we are working on these different uh, elements that I explained to you, for example, the task design, engine intervention strategies, and domain model. And we argue that they are interrelated somehow. So in the in a first study, we explore the engine intervention strategies. In another study, we want to explore the task design. So differentiating the task. Yeah. So always we use these prompts, as you say, because this is how we uh, the agent interventions are configured. So the, the, an agent is talking to the student with a message, for example. I, I was wondering regarding to the... Sorry, I can hear you. Because I don't know if you hear me. I don't know if my connection is very well. <laughs> I lost a small point. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm asking only if, if how, how people feel about the prompt and when is it good to prompt someone yeah. because mm -hmm. sometimes it's like annoying for example i just uh, delete all my prompting and i don't know if this is the typical reaction and it's only myself that i'm like this i don't know because we we were analyzing in a study we did mm -hmm. uh, with mobiles uh, prompting people it's more intrusive because you're in the in the daily life and so on you are not in a work mood etc but we we try to understand when this prompting was annoying for them Mm -hmm. And there were some some results. I don't know if you if yeah you... yeah I we reflected a little bit on based on the um, actually the qualitative analysis of the student comments. Mm -hmm. I mean uh, they provided answers to a final questionnaire, open uh, questions, and uh, yeah it seems that there are sometimes uh, there is frustration from the, the the students. That is why we reflect on this context context awareness that uh, the agents should be like more intelligent somehow to detect the context. Because in that case, may they don't get frustrated, for example. Uh, yeah, so there is, should be more work, but what we try to argue here is that by focusing on these pedagogical design elements, we can solve some of these problems, but also we can have the input from the non-technical stakeholders like teachers or the instructional designer. So this is the point, yeah. Thank you. We have I, think, one. I think Ali has yeah. raised his hand. So maybe you want to go with a really last question? And we yeah, uh, yeah, and we close with this. Ali, uh, I you try to be fast. So you mentioned something, uh, a term, if I remember, uh, co collaborative cognitive load. Yeah. First one, mm -hmm. that, and do you how do you measure it? Mm -hmm. Is it for uh, each individual or for the whole team? And do you consider the barrier for learning, like high cognitive load as a barrier to learning or cognitive load as a measure, uh, to, as a measure of engagement? Like, mm -hmm. do they engage to the task or do they didn't engage? Yeah, th thank you for this question. Yeah, we think that is relevant here because this team management behavior could be connected with this aspect of collaborative cognitive load. So if you take cognitive load and collaborative, this team management behavior could increase this collaborative cognitive load. So yeah, in terms of engagement, we haven't reflected on how we can measure it, but there, there are methods to measure this. Uh, but um, yeah, the connection is here with this team management behavior, actually. I don't know if uh, I answered your question, but yeah. I mean, yeah. is it a do you consider it as a positive measure or a negative one? Like, are you considering your approach 
increase the cognitive load or decrease it? Uh, yeah, for it example, as in the cognitive load, for example, that uh, you have like uh, this germane load that it is considered uh, positive. In the same way, you have in collaborative cognitive load some aspects that could be positive, but some others that could be negative. And how to balance this is, is, is hard, and especially to design in advance by thinking on this collaborative cognitive load. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that was the last question. Thank you, Costas, for your presentation. And I think Davinia is going to close the session. Well, I can close. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much again for all the presentations. Uh, you see, as we said at the beginning, um, the purpose was to disseminate uh, high level research in technology enhanced learning. Uh, so we keep the standards uh, in the, the community uh, so that we offer also an opportunity for the awardees of ECT 2020 to further disseminate their work and the evolution of their research lines as you have nicely done today. So we look forward uh, to further knowing about your work uh, in, the, in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, sharing, sharing uh, the work. And I think we can close with this, Mar. Yeah, I think that's all. I would like, like just to remember that Excel deadline is coming soon. <laughs> so these are were very good, nice papers from 2020. We hope we see similar ones in this 2021. So it's April 2nd, I think. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. 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 bye.